if we went to the moon and back 50 years ago, directed by the state and fostering an immense amount of partnership with business, what would it look like if we did that with the sustainable development goals, these social problems that are much more wicked and difficult in some ways than going to the moon, but that require that equal amount of urgency, of seriousness, of collaboration, of mm -hmm. catalyzing you know, bottom-up innovation. This is Rob Johnson, president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with my friend, Mariana Mazzucato. She is the co-founder and director of an institute at the University College London on the questions of innovation and public purpose. She's a frequent author. Her books include The Entrepreneurial State, The Value of Everything, and her newest book that we'll talk about in some detail today, The Mission Economy. Mariana, thanks for joining me. Hi, Rob. Thanks so much. It's wonderful to see you. You too. So here we are in this turbulent, prolonged time of pandemic, climate change on the horizon, social sustainability, just whether it's in north-south or what I call the first and third worlds inside of each advanced country, there are a whole lot of things that need to be addressed. And I believe, which you might say, the, the pandemic is awful, but there might be a silver lining in that it was the catalyst. It was an awakening. It was an unmasking. What are you seeing that you like? What are you seeing as opportunity? What are you seeing you don't like? And what do you wish you were seeing so you could like it more? Wow, great set of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I wish every conversation would begin like this. So, I mean, I guess what I like is that there is a real realization that this time it's different. You know, if you think back to what happened with the financial crisis, we just flooded the system with liquidity and, you know, hoped for the best. This time, what's really interesting globally is we have recovery packages that are not only very large, but they are increasingly structured. So in Europe, where I'm sitting, I'm sitting, well, I'm in the UK, Brexit, but yes, we're still in Europe. The EU recovery fund is actually conditional on governments that receive the funding to invest and to innovate around two big challenges that we have globally, which is climate change and digitalization. We didn't have that before. That's new. That's like a directed Marshall Plan. Now, whether it actually leads to what we hope it leads to, we can talk about later. But at least, you know, it's there. And we didn't have that. You know, with the financial crisis, most of the money that inundated the system actually ended up back in the financial sector. I think another thing that I find inspiring is that there is a realization that we're all only as hel um, healthy as our neighbor is on our street, in our city, in our nation, and globally. Had this crisis begun, for example, in an African country with a much weaker health system than the Chinese health system, we would all globally be worse off. So, you know, this, this um, realization that actually what we really need are stronger global health systems could potentially, this is the opportunity, I'm not saying it's a reality, wake us up to the fact that we need to revitalize and reimagine really a global welfare state. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess what I'm not seeing <laughs> is both of those things necessarily leading to the kind of actions and the speed that we really require them to in order to make those a reality. You know, we already see now with the vaccine, for example, what Dr. Tedros, the head of the World Health Organization, calls uh, a vaccine apartheid. So, you know, hoarding of vaccine yes. doses in rich yes. countries. Um, we also don't necessarily have solidarity in terms of how we govern vaccine production in terms of really fostering, again, what uh, the WHO calls collective intelligence, you know, through a patent pool to make sure that all the knowledge really is shared globally. So, you know, the same things that are an amazing opportunity that we have the seed for uh, are also the challenge. If we don't get the concrete action, then actually... You know, the fact that we're talking about solidarity and then don't govern it in a concrete way becomes actually part of the problem. When you talk about the who, I always think of Pete Townsend and the song <laughs> for today is we won't get fooled again. So uh, I think uh, these these questions of I mean, Mohammed Elarian just wrote a Project Syndicate piece where he said, none of us are safe until everyone's safe. Absolutely. And I and I just see this rising consciousness of the collective responsibility. I used to worry in the United States, we had this horrible episode of a shooting in Sandy Hook schools, 
And I always said, freedom isn't the freedom to carry a gun. It's also the freedom from being shot by others. Why aren't yeah. these freedom to and freedom from in balance? And yeah. the health crisis brings that on a much larger scale yeah. and international scale back into focus. By so the way, another th sorry, just one other thing that's inspired sure. me, actually, because it's good to, to also say more good things, given that we're living through so many tragedies right. right now. Something that's inspired me has been seeing how some countries that are still really developing have actually done incredibly well <laughs> in terms of how they've governed the crisis. And that has been related to investments that they've been mm -hmm. making historically within their own public administrations. And I'm thinking of places like Vietnam or the region of Kerala in India. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, have actually done better than the UK in, in many respects, where we actually outsource so much of our public competence to uh, consulting companies, something that a, recently a, a Tory lord called Lord Agnew called the infantilization yes. of governments. Quite interesting. I but anyway, so, you know, seeing this very different and heterogeneous experience globally, I think always reminds us that decisions matter, strategy matters, policy matters, both mm -hmm. in government, but also in the business sector. I've always said this in business, as have many of your grantees, I'm sure. You know, the fact that you have different, um, you know, business practices, but that these also then determine different levels of growth, different types of working conditions, different types of innovative performance in the business literature is about strategy mattering. But we sometimes forget about that also within the policy space. Yeah. And we end up thinking that, you know, oh, politics or, yeah, policies are all sort of top down and we'll see if they work or not. But the fact that really concrete ability to govern such an immense crisis has had differing, uh, you know, performance uh, uh, um, achievements, if you want, depending on what actually happened, how we governed relationships between the state, academia, business, civil society organizations. There's so many lessons there that we can learn from. Yeah, my former uh, partner in the documentary film business, Alex Gibney, has made a film called Totally Under Control, which is okay. a mockery of the relationship between the Trump administration's response and South Korea's response to the COVID crisis. And he released that 10 days before the presidential election to uh, right. <laughs> uh, say, try to nudge things along at the time we were all headed to the voting booths. But huh. these, uh, how would I say, these differences in governance, there's a book right now, very controversial in America, called Capitalism on a Ventilator, which is comparing oh. the U.S. and the Asian responses to COVID and saying, what is it? that makes you think the world's going to want to emulate the United States of America after our yeah. performance since last March. Obviously, yeah. we have a new administration in power now, and it's a chance to uh, change our yeah. mode of behavior. But uh, yeah. that, wasn't, that was not a particularly uh, strong demonstration of the greatness of the United States of America. Yeah, and you know, things period. change over, yeah, I mean, things change, right? So the U.S., if, if you think about how it reacted in terms of transforming and transitioning its productive structure to produce kind of wartime needs in World War II. You know, the Defense Production Procurement Act, for example, where they were able to do that also required yes. a lot of interaction, for example, with trade unions. Without the trade unions, that quick transformation wouldn't have been possible. And I think mm -hmm. looking at the varieties of capitalism, both globally, but also within any one country, how its way of doing capitalism changes over time. It's quite, again, interesting in seeing how that then determines the transformative capacity, the structural capacity on the ground to produce things, you know, to produce personal protection equipment, to produce a functioning test and trace system. But again, you know, during World War II, it wouldn't have happened without a very specific form of both, you know, a, a government, but also its interrelationship with civil society organizations like trade unions. And that brings us, I guess, to your book, Mission Economy, which I've had the good fortune of looking at an advanced copy, in a, at least vis-a-vis -vis the United States, it's an advanced copy. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I look forward to everybody being able to uh, find it, read it, and so forth. But let's talk about first, what inspired you to write that book now? You've written The Value of Everything, The Entrepreneurial State. You're very involved at high levels of policy all over the world. What did you want to say in this particular book? I think, um, I mean, the reason I wrote it is on the back of The Entrepreneurial State, which I wrote um, back actually in 2011, 
mm-hmm. as a pamphlet, which then got circulated to policymakers worldwide. It then became a full-fledged book with extra chapters in 2013. Mm-hmm. That really appealed to a lot of policymakers. You know, it, it really was about um, similarly, actually before Bill Janeway's book, <laughs> about very mm-hmm. much those issues about, you know, that innovation-led growth in places like Silicon Valley, but also if you look at what's happening in China today, if you look at what's happening in Denmark today, which, by the way, is the number one provider of high-tech uh, green digital services to China's green economy, and China's spending $1.7 mm. trillion on greening its economy, you couldn't explain that success without looking not only at the role of the state on kind of that early stage that you were talking about, but also on the demand side, also really helping those you know, companies that want to innovate to actually scale up, so not just startups, but scaling up. And that kind of thirst to know more about that story, changing the narrative of the state, going beyond just market fixing to what I call co-creating and co-shaping markets, led me actually to work with many different policymakers globally. And more recently, the way I was working, especially in the European Commission and with different countries' industrial strategies, was this idea that we could do better than just make a list of kind of great sectors to to finance, it really needed to learn the lessons from the internet, where the internet was a solution to a problem, right? So it wasn't just that DARPA financed it. DARPA was trying to solve a problem, which was getting the satellites to communicate. So this idea of putting, you know, on the front end of policymakers' minds, what are the problems (laughs) you're trying to solve? And how can you then use a problem-based, a purpose-driven, what I call a mission-driven approach to get as many different sectors in your economy to innovate, to collaborate, to invest, and literally put that into the design of procurement, grants, loans, and industrial strategy to crowd in kind of that bottom-up experimentation. So my experience in actually working with the European Commission or with you know ministers of uh, state like Greg Clark, who is the minister of business here in the UK, but also in the South African government and Brazil and so on, just led me to believe kind of two things. One, this is much harder to do than to just talk about. (laughs) And I wanted to write a book about the nitty gritty that I was learning along the way, but also just what an inspiring kind of, you know, a set of points it is when you change how you think about policy instead of thinking of it as a top-down process, right? You go lecture everyone that they should be, you know, fostering a carbon neutral city. What does it actually mean to bring different actors to the table? to actually in some ways co-design the process. You know, you need that kind of top-down idea of what it is we want to do, but the how to really catalyze mm-hmm. as much you know, innovation, investment, and collaboration, you really need what is often talked about as stakeholder capitalism, but I think it's really just talked about in terms of corporate governance, right? So bringing this notion of stakeholder value to the design process of how business, government, civil society organizations, coming back to our point before, work together at the local level to produce change, that requires rethinking not only the role of the state, but literally what policy is for and how to design it. So I wanted to write a book, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which kind of gave that sense of hope that we can do so much better, um, and also some of the how. And the reason I kind of focused on the moon landing was I don't think people realize just how much collaboration, uh, you know, went on. It wasn't just NASA. There was lots of investment from companies like General Motors, Honeywell, Motorola, mm-hmm. but also many others. And the collaboration really was purposeful. You know, NASA actually cared about things like how to design the procurement to also get a good deal for NASA. They even had a no excess profits clause, <laughs> which is quite interesting. Um, and really believed that in order to even know how to write the terms of reference of a partnership with business, they required themselves dynamic capabilities, what through my institute we call the dynamic capabilities of the public sector. Mm -hmm. And so because there's so much kind of government bashing out there saying, oh, yeah, Mariana, you talk about the entrepreneurial state, but actually look at, you know, what kind of states we have, this, that, the other. That's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You know, the more you think at best the state is there for, at best, to fix market failures, um, you know, the less you actually have an incentive to invest within state institutions and all those things they need to do much more than that. So to be collective kind of value creators coming, you know, to the language of my other book on value. Um, Any business that wants to create value will think about really intricate questions around, you know, organizational behavior, decision sciences, strategic management, all these great things that people study in master's in business administration. And yet public choice theory and new public management, which has really trickled Mm -hmm. down from Chicago type economics, 
has basically convinced so many civil servants that not only the best they can do is to fix markets, but even worse, you know, government failure is even worse than market failures. So occupy as little space as possible <laughs> and then get out of the way. Um, and that, that has reduced our, our competence, the capabilities within state institutions. And, and I guess the real reason I wrote the book was to revitalize our belief that, you know, if we went to the moon and back 50 years ago, directed by the state and fostering an immense amount of partnership with business, what would it look like if we did that with the sustainable development goals, these social problems that are much more wicked and difficult in some ways than going to the moon, but that require that equal amount of urgency, of seriousness, of collaboration, of mm -hmm. catalyzing, you know, bottom-up innovation, but also really getting good deals, you know, to make sure we don't get what we ended up with in Silicon Valley, which was a huge amount of state investment, socialization of risk, and then privatization of rewards. And we've seen that a bit in the pharmaceutical world as well. Absolutely. Where, uh, the taxpayer is putting up a lot of the basic research. Uh, yeah. I just published on that research on yeah. that in recent months, yeah. and and yeah. the uh, and then it's how they say the product is privatized, and the and the state doesn't own an equity holding in the successful pharmaceutical yeah. products that are created. But also, I, uh, to govern the patent system, right? I mean, even with yeah. the vaccine right now, unless yes. we have you know the patent pool that you know Dr. Tedros has been arguing for, we're going to have again a system where you have huge amounts of public and private, but a lot of public money going in, and then the patent system is misgoverned, what William Baumol used to call unproductive entrepreneurship, you know, this exactly. kind of rent seeking right. through the patents. And I, wanted, I, I brought a quote from reading of your work that I wanted to, uh, how would I say, put on the table. You said, these myths have been accepted as truth by so many, but none of them are inevitable. By rejecting these myths, we can rethink what the role of government should be in society. The problem is not big government, small government. The problem is the type of government and what it does and how. It should set off a catalytic reaction in society. So you're, you're envisioning, and what I guess I'm saying is we got to get over those stale myths. Yeah. And now there's a void. And you're trying to fill the void with a constructive vision of what to do. And boy, that's a lot better than despair in my book. So what, <laughs> what, what kind of myths do you think get in the way of the things that a government, in collaboration with people, deciding what values are that are worth purpose? What gets in the way? What are the myths that are the resistance that you mm. experience as you're working? So there's a lot of them. I mean, the first, of course, is that as soon as you start talking about the need for smarter government, more capable government, and the investments that are required, you get seen as someone who just thinks the state does everything and you need a bigger state. And, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's amazing how many intelligent people, <laughs> even some of your friends, Rob, uh, will go down that route and don't kind of get the point that actually this is all about partnership. It's all about collaboration. But if you don't have a bold, ambitious government that really gets what its role is, then business also loses out, right? So it's mm -hmm. not about saying government is more important. It's that it's impossible to also get the kind of public-private partnerships that we need if we've reduced our understanding and our thinking about the state to, again, be at best an enabler of business. Even, you know, mm -hmm. people really believe in stakeholder value. I was on a, on a, on a Davos um, uh, session at the opening of the World Economic Forum a couple weeks ago, and one of the you know, biggest proponents of stakeholder value actually said, uh, you know, uh, business is the prime wealth creator in society. And what we need is to make sure that wealth is, you know, shared. And that was the concept of stakeholder value that was being propagated. And I said, no, hold on a second. Stakeholder value must begin with the real conviction, if we believe in stakeholder value, that value is collectively created. It's not just created in business. Of course, business creates value. But so does government. And so do, increasingly, by the way, nonprofit organizations in some sectors, like in health. Um, and so what do we know about their ability to do so? What are the structures that are required? What's the culture? What's the you know, mm -hmm. um, a, a type of um, thinking in terms of kind of portfolio thinking that we were just talking about before in terms of the kind of investments that are required? If, you're, if you don't admit that you're also a value creator, you don't even ask those questions. So I think that's the biggest myth that, you know, uh, well, two, I guess, I just unpacked two myths. One is that as soon as you talk about the need for a smarter strategic, and my words, mission-oriented state, 
you're all just about the state as opposed to, you know, what is actually at the core of the point, which is that we need that in order actually to work together with other actors better. And two, another big myth is again, that about value, which is, you know, okay, fine. We can have a state, you know, a, a bold state doing innovation, but it's really just enabling, facilitating, de-risking this word. I can't stand de-risking the risk taking within business. So mm-hmm. this myth about who's actually a risk taker uh, is another issue because if you if you admit that you're a risk taker, of course, it's also going to be accepted that you'll make mistakes. And so a big problem in bottleneck, the third one here, is that you know as soon as a civil servant or a public servant makes a mistake, they're on the front page of the Daily Mail, right? So there's plenty of people that as soon as you do talk about the state as, as being you know, possibly much bolder, will start you know, listing all sorts of mistakes that states have made, whether it's Concord you know, that isn't flying, or in the UK, you know, British Leyland that received backing, or mm-hmm. Solyndra in the US. And so that's, again, a myth that comes from another myth, (laughs) which is if you don't admit that you're value creating, and, you know, you don't actually then think about things like trial and error, right? If you're really there just to enable business, then you shouldn't be making any kind of bold investments. Um, And, and because actually taking risks, not just de-risking, will require making some mistakes, if we don't have a framing that understands, you know, a risk taking state that is doing mm-hmm. so in order to foster, for example, a green transition, then just because it makes a mistake like Solyndra, bang, front page, right? And so one of the things with this, I, I already started doing it in, you know, the entrepreneurial state, which is to say, hold on, what if you actually looked at all the different investments, literally through a portfolio approach, you'd realize that when Solyndra happened, you know, Tesla also happened, the two companies actually received almost the same amount of money during a period mm-hmm. where Obama was actually trying to foster a directed recovery after the financial crisis. That then mm-hmm. sort of failed in terms of all the political infighting with the Tea Party, but a portfolio approach would allow you to say, yeah, of course we're going to make some mistakes. Just speak to Bill Janeway or any venture capitalist. You know, For every success, you will have many failures, but mm-hmm. how do you make sure you're not just bailing out the failures, but also getting some of the upside? And even though I've spoken about that in, you know, in the entrepreneurial state, what I did in, in, in this book, based on the kind of concrete work I've been doing with governments worldwide, is to say, okay, look, it's not enough to say we need more purpose-driven policy. We need to look at the tools, right? You know, what does it actually mean to have a portfolio approach? So you're not picking winners. Again, another myth that it's all about picking winners. You're not picking winners, but picking the willing right? That what you're doing is you're fostering a transition, you're making choices, of course, you're picking directions, but then you don't just hand out money to, you know, types of companies like small, medium enterprises or types of sectors, a, a list of your top sectors or types of technologies like quantum computing, but you really focus on problems and make sure that all your different sectors really are collaborating and investing towards that goal and look at the policy redesign that's required to foster that intersectoral and bottom-up experimentation. But also, you know, lastly, I just want to say something about the narrative, you know, given what I just mentioned, that as soon as you make a mistake, you're in the front page of the paper. (laughs) Uh, What does it mean to create a different narrative and literally story of of how wealth is created and the capabilities that are required in all different types of, you know, organizations, but also this idea that you're not really there to level the playing field, you know, a a mythological (laughs) way to talk about what government's for, but tilting the playing field, Uh, you know, again, taking risks and admitting that the economy has not just a rate, but a direction, and that we need a lot of debate. And, you know, we need Mm -hmm. a a, a national debate about which direction do we actually want to go. Um, and, And talking about directionality of growth, not just the rate of growth, already starts to pose so many different questions for policymakers and, it, and requires a different language, again, not leveling, but tilting, you know, uh, not de-risking, but taking risks, not fixing markets, but co-shaping and co-creating markets. And all these different words actually amount to a different story, because it is a different story. It's a different feeling of what it is that we're actually talking about in terms of policy and, again, collaborations between public and private. It's not simple. And, I, and you acknowledge yeah. that very humbly in your book. You acknowledge it over and over and over again. But we can't not pursue this agenda. Yeah. I have a chapter where I just talk about those myths. And I also try to demythologize some of the words that actually 
that, that we use. So the five myths mm-hmm. that I talk about are value, markets, efficiency, capabilities, and direction. But just the markets one for a minute, you know, even some heterodox economists sometimes get sloppy, including myself, <laughs> with how we use the word the market. The market is not the same thing as business, right? So when we say, you know, the market versus, say, the state, it's, it's really what we're talking about is business and the state. But markets are the outcomes. Markets are the outcomes of how we govern business, yeah. how we govern government. There's different ways to govern. We know this mm-hmm. business, stakeholder, shareholder value. There's different ways to govern public organizations, right? Whether they're just market fixing or actually explicitly about co-creating and co-shaping markets. And that's where that BBC example comes in that I just wrote a report on. The Mm -hmm. BBC as an organization has actually explicitly within tried to achieve public value, this really interesting word that they've used to also monitor their own uh, uh, um, um, remit really and, and what they do and the success of what they do. But markets are an outcome of these governance decisions and interrelationships, right? So then Mm -hmm how government and business work together, how they relate, what is the deal literally within the contracts. I always come back to the issue of contracts. Everything in the end is almost a contract. Patents are contracts, Mm -hmm. procurements are contracts, and procurement is a huge portion of government budgets. We can design these in different ways, and they do matter. Coming back to our first point about also with COVID, just seeing the real differences in how governments have performed depending on kind of that capacity. And, you know, the myths around efficiency have really led to a lot of this outsourcing of the government brain to the private sector. There's no problem with some outsourcing, but it depends what you're outsourcing. I would argue that the whole NSA scandal um, and, you know, the Snowden affair in some ways is an outcome of the U.S. government having outsourced its IT kind of system Mm -hmm. and management Mm -hmm. and understanding of information technology and digital uh, capabilities. So, you know, this is precisely what uh, this lord um, in the UK government, Lord Agnew, called the infantilization of government, which is when you're overly yeah. consultifying your, your, your structures. And this is what NASA, in the story that I tell about the moon landing, was actually very aware of. There was this wonderful quote by Ernest Brackett, the head of procurement in NASA, who said, we have to be aware of brochuremanship. <laughs> you know, today, this would be the PowerPoints of, you know, the Deloitte, <laughs> the PWCs. At the time, it must have been, you know, private sector companies coming in and said, yes, pay us this because we're so good at this, that, and the other. And they did collaborate a lot with business, but they did it from a from from you know a perspective also of their own expertise and understanding of the world around them. And as soon as you start stop investing within your own dynamic capability within the public sector, you can't be, you know, you won't know how to write those terms of reference and you won't be a good partner and you will get captured. And that's the irony of it all. Those same people who worry so much about government capture and corruption, it's actually that mentality in some ways that leads to capture. Because by not believing Mm -hmm. in Mm -hmm. what government can do if we structured it properly, then you end up with pretty lame and inefficient and easily captured government institutions. If you look at Singapore, they pay and train their civil servants so they don't have to be part of the revolving door when their kids go to college. They pay them, they give them pensions, they give them budgets, they give them training so they can be excellent and they can do it for a career. There's a lot of work to do so that the experience of the public sector that we have in the aftermath of the kind of wreckage that began with the Reagan years can validate your vision. Mm-hmm. We, we, gotta, we gotta bring the things that make people higher quality and more confident and more courageous to the table so that the population can then look at it and say, wow, those guys are good, they did good, they weren't corrupt, and they didn't spin off and, how do I say, collect a salary from my tax money for a decade and then spin out to the people they were actually working for. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And it's both pay and working conditions, and um, but also, it's also the remit, right? So. That's right. Just just think of, you know, someone like Steve Chu, who was a Nobel Prize winner in physics mm-hmm. in the US, a Chinese American. He mm-hmm. accepted to go be a civil servant to, you know, run the Department of Energy under Obama, 
not because Obama said, oh, come in and help design at best a carbon tax so we can you know, de-risk business or you know, fix a market failure. What Obama invited him to do is direct an agency, which you know, Obama really wanted to help, again, direct the 800 billion stimulus program because he wanted this green recovery after the financial crisis. Right, um, right. And you know, I'm sure, well, I, I can't say I'm sure, no one can be sure, but I, I really don't think Steve Chu would have accepted that job had you know it not have you know been as ambitious the task which was come in you know direct this agency set up an ARPA E which is what he then did um, he brought in um, Arun Majumdar to uh, direct ARPA E itself he then ended up being the head of energy for Google Arun Majumdar so the kind of you know that that uh, uh, revolving door was more based on actually capability you know you were coming into a Department of Energy which was seen, seeing itself actually as an investor of first resort, not just the lender of last resort, hence that portfolio perspective we were talking about before, Tesla and Solyndra and so on. And it's an honor to work for such an agency. So, you know, you can also do it through pay. And, you know, Singapore does pay up to, I think, a million dollars to the heads of their departments, but also all civil servants get very good uh, pays and pensions. But it's also about what, what you know, how you're described, I mean, what is your role, what is the remit? of the place mm-hmm. where you're working. Are you actively mm-hmm. co-creating value or just fixing yep. the mistakes that happen along the way with business? You're leading by example. You're practicing what you preach. And, Thank you, Rob. And I really wish you the best in, and hope to be supportive of you convincing people because there is a cynicism that those of us who think that government can play a different role are just fo- romantically foolish. Yeah. Just like the market fundamentalists were romantically foolish. And it's incumbent upon us to persevere with the courage to bring this new design, to sing this new song. And uh, thanks. I, I'm, I'm very grateful that you came and talked about it with me today. Thank you so much. And I'm very grateful Thank that you. you've taken extra time. <laughs>